started here, so I see that a bunch of you have already signed in already. For those that haven't, the sign-up sheet is here. Uh, make sure to sign up before you leave today. And without further ado, I'll introduce today's speaker. So, Dr. Michael Noseworthy received his MSc and PhD degrees at the University of Guelph, um, and that's when he first became interested in um, doing MRI and magnetic resonance spectroscopy and so on of uh, brain injuries. Um, and when then he continued his work on MRI methods in Toronto, first earned a postdoctoral fellowship in imaging physics at Sunnybrook Health Science Center, and then as an MRI physicist at the Ch Hospital for Sick Children, and was an assistant professor in medical biophysics and medical imaging at the University of Toronto. Um, and then in 2003, he and his entire lab uh, moved to uh, St. Joseph's Healthcare and the body, uh, Brain and Body Institute at McMaster University. And uh, basically following three years there as an assistant professor in radiology and medical physics at McMaster, um, Mike changed his primary appointment to uh, electrical and computer engineering, which I'm sure will go over well with this crowd. Um, and that's where he currently resides as an associate professor. Um, and so I'd like to just say, somewhat like a few of our previous speakers, um, Mike sent a fairly modest biography, I'd say, and so I, I'll ad-lib for maybe just a minute or so about some of his other achievements to fill in the gaps. And so, yeah, basically, although he was uh, too modest to say, Mike runs a really active research lab. Uh, that's very well funded and currently has something like 12 grad students or something I, I think he mentioned last night. Um, but somehow while doing all of that, he simultaneously has worn many hats in various administrative positions. Uh, for example, he's currently the director of the School uh, for Biomedical Engineering at McMaster and also the scientific director of the Imaging Research Center at St. Joseph's Healthcare. And in terms of service, he sits on a number of editorial boards. Uh, I won't read them all, but they're in the bio that I sent out with the email. He's an active member in many professional societies. Again, those are in the, the bio that I sent out. Um, and in addition to his substantial research and service contributions, I should also mention that he's an accomplished teacher. I saw online, actually, that uh, Mike was awarded um, basically the, the President's Award for Graduate Student Teaching in Engineering, uh, which I understand is one of the highest uh, teaching honors at McMaster. So with that, I'm very glad that Mike agreed to come and talk to us today and visit Winnipeg and had a great chat so far. I'm looking forward to your talk. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. So delighted to be here. And actually, I didn't know you dug so much into my uh, background. So. Yeah, it's There's an uh, interesting read. Yeah, I thought you were going to tell me that, or tell everybody how much hockey I play and coach. Too, so. <laughs> so that's just something else when I have all my free time. I coach, uh, I was coaching two hockey teams at the same time as well. So now I'm down to one, so it's a bit dull. Anyway, so I'm really delighted to be here, as I said. And uh, I am going to talk about one of the areas of my work, which is traumatic brain injury. And uh, I've got lots of reasons to go into traumatic brain injury and interest. Uh, from a personal point of view, I've had my own TBIs. I play a lot of hockey, I, and I'll get into that in good time. But uh, I've seen a lot of TBIs as a coach, uh, playing hockey, uh, uh, coaching hockey. And plus, it's just a really big area right now. And it's like, what's going on with this thing? We've got great tools with which to be able to understand traumatic brain injury. So where are we going with this? I mean, uh, that's the big thing. So I know uh, I like to start out with some hockey stuff. This guy doesn't coach the Maple Leafs anymore, but I, I just like to put this uh, guy up there because I can't stand the Maple Leafs. So I hope that there's probably some uh, Jets fans here. Uh, Randy Carlisle played a lot of hockey in his time. And uh, he had this really, really interesting philosophy about what causes concussions. And, and you know, when you, when you look at the, you know, the, the people, the general people, they'll listen to a guy like Coaches the Leafs. He must be, must be a pretty smart guy. Well, no. Okay. So he had a real, I, I couldn't believe when I read this like a couple of years ago. So he said his theory of concussion is because everyone has a helmet on. And I, what? So that, yeah, this is the thing. Yeah, everyone has a helmet on, and under your skull you have a helmet, you have a heat issue. So the helmet keeps your brain too hot, 
And because you're sweating a lot more, your brain swells. Now, this is Carlisle, right? Your brain, your brain is closer to your skull. And this is a paraphrase exactly what he said. Think about it. Does it make sense? It's common sense. So, you know, when you, when you see what in the popular media, like someone like a coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs, he's an ex-coach now, but uh, you're wondering, like, the general people think, oh, that must make sense. The days when they didn't have helmets, nobody got concussed. Now, that's not what happened. Nobody reported them, right? Because uh, in those days, we had catastrophic injuries where people would have their skulls fractured, where, you know, that's more than just a concussion, right? So they didn't have a device on their head to prevent that stuff. So we have just a lot more information in terms of reporting and things like that going on out there. Now, concussion is really complicated. And this is one of the reasons there's so much research on it and why it's so important to understand all the different elements of what's, uh, what's relevant in concussion and causing them. We know that we can, do, we can do lots of studies on animals where we study concussion. We can drop as a standardized method where we drop a weight from a certain height down a tract on an anesthetized animal. We can produce concussions fairly reproducibly with this method. But we know when we're looking at humans, everybody's getting a very, very different injury. All right? So and this, is, this is really, we're, I'm going to drive this point home in many times throughout my talk. You know, we get football injuries where we can have someone getting hit full on. We can get them having rotations. Um, we can get all kinds of different forces that actually affect the head. Now, one thing I want to stress as well is concussions are not simply getting hit in the head. I play a lot of hockey. I still do. When I played full contact hockey up till the age I was 26, and I broke my femur, and that was enough contact for me. So that's uh, you know put me into the non-contact leagues. But I'll tell you. Uh, just getting hit in the, in the chest and your whole head is going forward and snapping, you're getting all kinds of very complex forces going on within the, the, the brain inside the skull, right? So there's not just being hit in the head, that's very, very important. We have lots of things that are potentially happening. The brain, if you've ever felt real brain tissue that's just freshly excised, it's very gelatin-like, gelatin it's not a hard structure, so we know it bounces around inside the skull. And uh, there's some very, very interesting physics in terms of the forces that are going on. Now, if you look way back, way, way back in the literature, we know that physicists were actually contemplating and understanding or, or trying to figure out what the force nature was in terms of uh, concussions and what could be causing concussions. So this is from 1945, uh, Professor Holborn uh, from Oxford. He was saying that uh, skull bending fracture rotations of the head are important. So the, not just these these big catastrophic things that could happen, but actually all these funny motions in 3D that could potentially cause injuries to the brain. So we knew that there were these problems going on, and it's been sitting there for a very, very long time. Now, we look at problems of concussion in, in, in sport. Now, you know, this is one of the hardest things to really think about, because we know that a great deal of the concussions, especially in the pediatric populations, are coming through sport. Now, we want our kids to play sports because we don't want them playing computer games. We want them to exercise and get cardiovascularly fit, not finger fit, right? We want, so it's sort of this thing we're always saying, we want to get out there and play some hockey, but don't play some hockey. Don't hit your head, right? So we're always co competing with this thing. But let's just stay with, we want to keep our kids in sport for sure, because it does give us our kids fitness, and mentally it's very good. Sport is good for lots of factors. So these are some of the, sp the stats. Kids that play organized sports are six times more likely to get a concussion. That's from the, this is the standard Canadian statistics that we have here. And it's a conservative estimate on what the concussions actually are out there. We think there's probably a lot more. And classically, men show, or males, show underreporting in concussion. We know that males, men, men are all pretty kind of stupid. I'm one of them, and I'll admit I'm stupid too. Uh, we don't want to admit that we're injured or hurt or whatever or who knows what. You know, and I know my wife always says, you should go to the hospital on that. And I'm like, no, it's just broken ribs. I've done it. It's, they're they're going to tell me they're broken, and I know, okay? So I don't want to waste my whole day getting an x-ray. So, but that's men. Men don't report. Now, men don't report concussions either because if you look at the philosophy of the game, be it football or soccer or hockey, men don't want to report those kinds of things because it's seen as a kind of a, a wimpy thing. It's like, a, it's like, what do you mean you're, you're injured? There's nothing wrong with you, right? So men are more like trying to do the dumb tough guy thing. Interestingly, I've coached both male hockey and female hockey. 
you'll see probably about twice as many concussions in female hockey as you do in male. There's a lot of theories that go with this, and it's quite interesting. I played very, very pretty high level hockey, and I know what it's like to be hit, and I know what it's like to give hits. And in male hockey, you're always looking. You're always, where's that guy coming from? Because I'm going to get taken out. So men, their, their heads are what we call keep your head up, right? That's what we say in hockey. Because in women's hockey, there's no contact. It's a finesse game. And they're quite often, they're looking down like this. And if you get, just think about it, 10 people skating around on a nice surface, statistically, you're going to get a collision. It's going to happen. And in female hockey, when those collisions happen, they don't see them coming. Okay, so they're more likely to be, con this, is, uh, this is what the theory is, okay? They're more likely to be concussed simply because they're not expecting this hit to happen. Then that also goes back to the fact that women are more likely to report an injury if they're not feeling well from a concussion or whatever. Men are like, they're not going to do that, okay? So, as likely. So it's, it's complicated, but I'm just saying that we definitely have some differences in statistics between men and women. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a hockey guy, and I, and, uh, I like to know who's playing hockey. Interestingly, about 4.4% of Canadians play hockey. I thought it was 50%. Like, that I thought when I read this, I thought, man, it must be 50%. But that's not right. It's actually not as many as I thought. But still, it's 1.2, uh, 1.3 million people play hockey in Canada of some sort of level. Could be really organized or really not. And uh, the number two country in the world that plays hockey in terms of their statistics is Finland. Although when I did part of my sabbatical in Finland, I couldn't find anybody who played hockey because I was actually looking to play some hockey in Finland and I didn't know anybody that did that. But anyway, so there's a lot of people that do play and female hockey has definitely been quite popular in recent years and it's growing more and more. So we definitely have a, a source for concussive injuries, especially with hockey. Now I like to put this out in terms of uh, hockey. This is me, okay, I'm putting out a picture of myself. So this is me a long time ago. I got some thing that says snowmobilers, that was my team, I guess. And, uh, and this is me now. So I, I play for the McMaster professors team. So we play against Western and uh, Laurier and all these other professors teams. And uh, you can certainly see the difference in terms of the helmets. Back in those days, nobody wore a face mask. It's just a thing to protect your teeth because your eyes, you don't really need those. You need your teeth more than your eyes. You know what I mean, it doesn't make sense. Nowadays, the helmets are very, very high in design, very, very high impact plastic shields in front of you or cage mesh. Uh, to protect facial injuries and things like that. Um, the game is a lot more faster than it ever was. Uh, the equipment is lighter uh, and etc. It's You actually don't even know you're wearing this stuff compared to the old days when we used to play a lot of hockey. So there's certainly differences in the equipment and if you listen to some of the philosophical side of things and some people say there's more concussions in hockey because the equipment is so much better. And now people are swinging their sticks around and saying, no, who cares, that guy's got a full helmet on. Well, he's never going to be hurt. I'm not going to talk about the philosophical argument of whether that's true or not, but I will say that the game is way faster than it ever was. The equipment is so light, you can go so much faster than ever, which means your forces potentially are now higher because of your velocity is quite a bit bigger. Now we know what concussion is a little bit. We know that uh, what the feelings are like, we know what the symptoms are like, and it's a very, very complicated pathophysiological process, I will say. We know that it's induced by biomechanical forces. There could be uh, injuries where the brain is hitting the other side of the skull. We get what are called contra-coup injuries. We get rotational shearing injuries, etc. It is a very, very complicated injury in, in humans, simply because the forces are very, very complicated. We can measure these things as it could be something like a blow to the head or face, or elsewhere in the body where the head become, goes through some sort of rapid deceleration process. You get potentially rapid onset of short-lived impairment and neurological functions. We know that these things occur. They could resolve themselves spontaneously. Um, we get lots of potential changes um, that are maybe indicative of a structural injury, but definitely there's something potentially metabolic as well, so there's combination effects. And one thing people don't resolve, really understand is the fact that concussion may or may not involve a loss of consciousness. Concussion, when you get knocked out cold, as we'd say, that's definitely a concussive force that's causing an effect. But you don't necessarily need to be un un like knocked out to have a concussion. The key point right here is my last point right here. Is Now, this is mild traumatic brain injuries, which could involve up to someone that had a, 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 a being knocked out. The, the key thing that's the hardest part is there's no structural abnormalities seen on any structural neuroimaging, be it CT or MRI. So typically we have someone who's been unconscious for some time, they'll want to get a CT to see if there's any bleed, like a subdural or epidural bleed, to rule out that 
And that's an immediate response needs to be done and dealt with the bleeding, of, a bleeding on the brain. But most of the time, like 99, whatever, lots of times, the mild traumatic brain injury, there's nothing abnormal on the brain scan at all. That we can typically see. So we have to result, result to these tests that we actually do to test whether the concussion is something uh, important or severe or not. So these, we usually resolve, uh, or resolve some sort of metric by asking the patient how they feel. And these ones kind of bother me, right? I mean, this is all about how the patient feels, and it's nothing. As an engineer, I like to measure something. Give me a number that I can measure with a tool. And this is our tool. It's a questionnaire. And it's the, the post-concussion symptom scale, PCSS, goes through everything from headache, nausea, sleep problems, uh, sadness, nervousness, everything, visual problems. If you're sensitive to light, you can't think, etc. And the patient would scale these, but based on zero to five, based on their own feelings for this. Now the PCSS is what we have. There's a variant of it called the, uh, the, the PCSI, the post-concussion symptom inventory. It's pretty well the same thing. This is what maybe people would use in pediatrics, same kind of thing. But basically, it's just a number we get based on what they feel. And the problem with that is, it's all over the map. It's crazy. I've scanned people where before we've done the scan, we do PCSS and go through the whole thing. And the one person I did, it was a PCSS of one. Now, if you look at this, six is zero, is the really severe. So, sorry, it goes from zero to six. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of times these PCSS scale up around 50 or 60 for people that have been concussed. I've seen people report one the day after their concussion. And, I, and I'm just, well, why are you here? You know, it's not really. But they were knocked unconscious. So it, uh, you know, so just to show you, it's all over the place in terms of this type of a score. PCSI, PCSS, PCSI. Uh, clinically, we would do something called a SCAT test for sports injury. So the sport concussion tool assessment tool. There is now in the third edition of this. A whole bunch of questions that we would go through with the uh, um, the, the patient, and also there are some neurological exams that were uh, would actually be done with the SCAT test as well. And uh, one of the things that the neurologist would evaluate would be something like the Glasgow Coma Scale, where if you get 15, you're, it's perfect, there's nothing wrong with you, but we're looking at eye response, verbal response, motor response, and trying to assess those from a neurologic point of view. So it's not the patient saying things, but now the neurologist is making some estimate of what's wrong with the patient. So the SCAN test has a whole bunch of other things involved with it, but it's something that we can use as a, maybe a better metric. In the, in the long run of things, we're trying to, to decide how do we get these patients or kids or whatever back to place. So we have what are called the return to play guidelines, which were developed at McMaster by uh, Carol DiMatteo and her team, which is a colleague of mine. And we go to the doctor immediately in step one, no activity for the first bit. And it's basically this iterative process where if you have symptoms, you, you stay resting. Uh, you don't want kids playing video games. You want them in maybe slight darkness, not pitch dark, but Light sensitivity is a big thing with uh, post-concussion. I know I've had my own concussions, and bro, this would be too bright. And the, the last concussion I had, it would be just way too much for me. So, um, you know, these, the light exercises then follow with this, and then hopefully, uh, once we get through those steps, that they can, they can put up with it, they get to back to their sport, whatever it is. Uh, eventually, maybe some higher heart rate things, uh, maybe back to the, uh, if it's hockey, let's say, or if it's football, back to the sport, but no contact. If they go through these things and there's no symptoms coming back, and the key thing here is exercise tends to bring back the symptoms of concussion, which is a very, very interesting finding that uh, there's many people like Lawrence uh, and back there are working on the understanding of what could be happening with uh, the effect of exercise on returning these uh, symptoms back in concussion. And eventually we get a person cleared by the doctor, they can go back to their contact sport or whatever it is, but I see it's an iterative process that they actually go through to return to their level of play. This could take a couple of weeks, it could take months, depending on the injury. So it's really, really uh, all over the place. So what do we have for assessment of these? We've got a host of tools. Now I'm an imaging person, so obviously we have a host of radiological tools that are at our disposal. Now this is just some of the, spe the, the main ones. We have MRI. Okay, that's an easy one. It's non-ionizing radiation. We can do this all day and night if we wanted to. We can do T1, T2 weighted, diffusion scans, spectroscopy, functional imaging. We can do multinuclear spectroscopy or MNS or sodium or phosphorus or whatever. There's lots of ways we can play with an MRI. We can look at CT, so basically structural features on a CT scan. SPECT and PET are nuclear medicine techniques. We can give maybe a radio tracer to mine something and then measure potentially, let's say, some particular receptor or feature inside the brain. 
We have ultrasound, maybe that might be of use. You can do transcranial Doppler as an example to measure the same blood flow. And some people are actually doing that as a simple metric to understand some of the features of blood flow changes to the brain. Um, really, well, how much is the technology being used? If you went for a standard, if you had a concussion and went for a standard protocol workup at the hospital, if it's just a, your community hospital, you may have a CT, they may follow up with an MRI, just standard, nothing special kind of MRI scan, and they'll say, well, you've got a normal brain, there's nothing wrong with that. Other features that are being investigated are protein biomarkers. We know when the brain gets concussed, we'll get a transient opening in the blood-brain barrier, and you'll get some release of some uh, peptides into the bloodstream. So we can measure blood or whatever. Are, these, are there different things we can measure? Well, the biggest ones that are out there are S100B as a protein marker in the, in the bloodstream that is there after the blood-brain barrier gets opened up. And then there's a few other things as well, from this NSE or uh, myelin-basic protein, etc. But these things are non-specific. They just says, okay, there was a concussion. We don't know how much of the brain is damaged. We don't know how bad that certain area is damaged. It's like measuring a liver enzyme. If you got someone with a liver disease, you measure an enzyme. You don't know. You say, yeah, yeah, you got, uh, you know, you got some uh, transaminases in your blood. We know you got a liver problem. We don't know if it's focal or diffuse or what. We just know there's a liver problem. Same thing with this. We just don't know where it is. So is there anything we can do that's focal? So we certainly have our methods in imaging. Now, this is the stuff we, that are, what I would say is, a, pardon the pun, a no-brainer. We get oh. someone in there like this that's been hit with a baseball bat. Okay, if you can't see that, you can't see, you're having a problem seeing. So that, you know, you get a huge fracture of the skull, uh, you get a huge bleed underneath. I mean, these are pretty <coughs> obvious, they're catastrophic injuries where you get fractures and you get, you get pretty big bleeds underneath, big, uh, big like hematomas, subdural hematomas or epidural, and those are fairly straightforward to see on CT scans. So an epidermal hematoma, hematoma, you get some bleeding here, you get some blood underneath the skull, and those are fairly straightforward to pick out. And we want to definitely know whether those are happening if we get any of these larger type injuries that are, that are, uh, that are more than just a minor concussion. We know, however, when we're looking at traumatic brain injury with CT and MRI, uh, in this particular study, 87 parent patients with a GCS lower than 12, MRI was a stronger predictor of outcome than compared to CT. Now in this particular case, they're looking for things like microbleeds, which we can really easily see on an MRI scan, because of the paramagnetic nature of the deoxyhemoglobin that would be present, and then the methemoglobin that would be present as well once the bleed gets a little bit older. So it becomes a really, really straightforward test to be able to see those. But not everybody has these little tiny microbleeds when you're looking at concussive injury either. Another thing that comes out in terms of uh, MTBI. Now this is one I, I like to show this kind of strange image. Is here's two patients. One of them has had a TBI and one of them hasn't. Okay. Now which one has got the TBI? This is a nice T1 weighted image. And uh, if you look at these, this scan, you know, someone like me who's an engineer, they might go, well, look, this person here, what are all these black dots everywhere? This guy doesn't look good, okay? Maybe that guy's messed up. This person's brain looks pretty good, I think, right? I'm an engineer, what could I know? The truth is, this is the problem we see with brains. Not everybody's had a baseline MRI that we can now compare it with, right? We're not all rats. So a guy like me, I've got so many MRIs I can compare, I guess. But the thing is, this person on the left is the healthy person. This just, they just have a lot of virtual robin spaces in their brain, which are, you see them in all kinds of people. They're no problem at all. This person right here has had the concussion, but it looks like a good brain. This person's brain looks a bit weird, right? So these are the problems we run into, is what, what, is, uh, what was the normal brain before they had the injury? We don't have that information. But there's ways we can actually deal with that, which I'm going to hopefully leave you with uh, after my talk. So normal, and then acutely on the other side. Acute concussion. Everyone needs a baseline MRI, so not everyone can have that, as I said. So a guy like me, uh, just to tell you a little bit about concussion, the last one I had two years ago, uh, I went in the day after my concussion. I was knocked out cold. Some do hockey, but I won't get into that story. I went in the next day, and I said to my uh, radiology friends, I need a head MRI, brain. They said, what do you want done? And I said, uh, I don't know, routine head. Fair enough, whatever you want. So they did a routine head, and of course I didn't see anything, and neither did anybody else. Knowing perfectly well, I had a concussion protocol already developed that I've been using on concussed patients, and I'd forgotten that I actually had that. I'd forgotten that I'd actually developed it. So, but that's just what concussions do. They kind of scramble the eggs a little bit. They don't remember these things. 
So we need baseline MRIs. So this is what I have. I like to kind of show the gadgets, some gadget guy. So from 2003 to 12, I had a GE3T, um, which was called HD. It's the old system. And then I was lucky to get a couple million dollars, and we upgraded to the latest and greatest Cygnus 750, and this is one of my students, Conrad Rockle, uh, with his toy that he made here that's a, an MRI-compatible ergometer, which is made of oak and brass screws, and we'll get into ergometers soon. But we got lots of channels, 32 received, 3 transmit, we do multi nuke spectroscopy, we do pretty well everything, and we've got pulse programming tools, we build our own hardware, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's quite a, quite a good facility. We have a, a, a Biograph 16 PET CT right beside it, which we could use for research, but we don't have a cyclotron anywhere nearby, so we're restricted to FDG and sodium fluoride and a little bit of rubidium. Um, I have a 64 channel MRI compatible EEG, which we're starting to incorporate into some of our protocols. Uh, so we have a, a fairly good lab for doing imaging of all different kinds. So we're pretty lucky in that, that sense. And I got lots of computer stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So we can apply certain techniques to looking at TBI. So we have structural, functional, and metabolic imaging as potential avenues we can now probe our TBIs with. So lots of people out there have done structural imaging, no doubt. I've done it, right? Lots of people have done functional imaging. Yeah, I've done that too, right? Resting state, task-oriented stuff, no problem. And you guys have probably all seen some of this stuff in other talks, right? Functional MRI, diffusion, maybe all that stuff, bits and pieces. We can do metabolic imaging, which includes proton spectroscopy, which is just NMR, that's all it is. But we can also do phosphorus spectroscopy, which is want to look at ATP levels or phosphocreatine or whatever. And I've got a grad student working on that right now. And sodium MRI, we can do that as well. We can look at intranatural set of sodium. We've got another student working on that too. So lots of stuff. Structural MRI, the first thing that uh, I always say when I know there's a concussion patient coming through, of course we have the CT, may, well, may or may not have the CT. But the first thing I like to do is what's called susceptibility weighted imaging. It's a technique developed by Mark Hakey, who's at Wayne State, and it's a technique that's really, really sensitive to deoxyhemoglobin. We know that deoxyhemoglobin with the four unpaired electrons is going to be sensitive to distortions in the local magnetic field. That's what deoxyhemoglobin will do. And for this particular case, this is a, a slide from Karen Tong at Loma Linda. She used to be in Saskatoon, actually. And um, there's a bunch of little black dots here. These are little micro hemorrhages that have happened in someone that was a boxer. So this is someone that's, they call it a punch drunk, right? So they're kind of slurring like Muhammad Ali is now. They're slurring their speech all the time. All these little micro bleeds that are there from being hit in the head so many times. So this is the first kind of scan that I always recommend are done because it's a structural scan and we can see truly if there's any kind of uh, injury that's present in there. So I'm going to show you, uh, actually my nose is running a little bit here. This is why they call me noseworthy. So uh, uh, I'm going to show you a scan on a, a kid that I did. This kid, 14-year-old um, guy, and uh, they said he's normal. But he had abnormal uh, behavior. He went from being an A student to a D student. He had a, a big injury. He had a snowboarding accident. So he went, uh, he was out on the, out on the hill, and uh, he saw the good-looking girls, you know. And uh, he said, oh, helmet, don't need it, you know. Got to let the hair go in the wind, right? The, girl, the girls are like that. <laughs> Poor guy, he wiped out, cracked his head on the ice. He was almost dead. He was Glasgow Coma Scale 3 was his lowest point. And even uh, many, like over a year later, they still said he had a normal MRI. Well, what, you know, they said he's just not the same kid he used to be. So I scanned him. And this is his uh, 3D T1 weighted. It looks like a fantastic brain when you look at it, a beautiful brain. So then I said, well, has anyone ever run an SWI on this guy? Because I, I don't know, it's structural, it may be a bit weird there. So I said, let's do that. So this is what I got. This is the same slice as this one over here. That's identical. And you can see, this is all this old hemocytorin that's built up in these frontal areas right here. This is, uh, this is uh, I think it was 16 or 14 months after his injury. And you can still see these old bleeds, they're, they're, they're just all this old iron precipitate now from having small micro bleeds in there. But you can see structurally, this is a very, very important scan to be able to run it. And really, it's nothing that you need to measure. It's clinically extremely useful when you're looking at and assessing traumatic brain injuries. So this should be definitely added with every kind of scan. This is a, this is a scan that's a, it's, it's a Siemens scan, right? You guys got Siemens MRIs everywhere in the city. And this should be on your scanners, it should be run. Uh, for GE, we had to make the sequence ourselves, which wasn't that hard. Uh, I run on GE, but I can hack any old scanner. So 
we can run SWI on the GE scanner, no problem. It's more it's a post-processing scan than anything. So uh, this was on our GE3T. So we then started to embark on a study. We're still acquiring data. So this is more on the preliminary side on pediatrics. So we certainly have some structural imaging changes we can see with SWI. But I, when we first started uh, doing uh, traumatic brain injury in kids, I thought SWI is going to be the winner. We're going to, every kid will have this and it's going to show us everything. I'll say right now, I was disappointed in the fact that very rarely would we find these little microbleeds, which is, that's probably good, right? That means the injuries aren't that catastrophic. This was, that's terrible. That guy was in really bad shape. So we did this uh, study, and we're still recruiting, but this is preliminary, so I thought I'd show you. Um, so we have uh, kids that are injured, TBIs, and uh, they're pediatric, so they're mostly teenagers. And then we scan them uh, about 30 days after their injury, then 90 days after that, and then 90 days after that. So looking for longitudinal changes in these kids. So we have all these different symptoms. We did the usual PCSS and all those other things. And, uh, and then we, uh, th this is just shows you how all over the map it is. So PCSS score on different scans from the first time we scanned them to the third. And you can see uh, patient number one, they started out 78 and they get better as they get uh, uh, more and more recovered. Uh, you can see patient number two doesn't seem to change. Um, you can see patient number five, they had a PCSS of zero after their injury. And then zero again, and then you know seven months later, they're at one. So whatever it means, it's just a real mess. It's, it's a metric that's a real mess. Even this number six started with 51, and then down to three, 11. I guess you're getting better, but you know, so it's a it's a tough tough thing to use as a as a marker. So um, just to show you some of the, the structural things we're doing with these kids, so we're doing diffusion tensor imaging. That's one of the big structural changes we're looking at. It gives us a very very solid understanding of diffusion characteristics in white matter. Uh, we can look at gray matter, whatever that means, but it's mainly for looking at white matter integrity. The idea being. When you're getting a, one of these shear entries, you're getting shear changes in the white matter that are going to be reflected in changes in diffusivity of water, potentially through like little holes or little micro shears in the white matter. So we did this one study where we looked at the FA value, which is a metric that gives an indication of the shape of the diffusion ellipsoid, and we looked at uh, the, the corpus callosum, which is said to be the most sensitive area to some of these shear entries. Now I started doing. I, I threw this one in because it's kind of funny. Um, I started doing DTI because I had all these lawyers calling me about, um, and I just picked one off the web, this is from the US somewhere, saying, can you do DTI on our, pay, on our, on our clients? I'm like, who is this? And it's some lawyer from somewhere. And this, I, don't, I don't know who these people are, but just as an example, there's all these lawyers out there that are thinking DTI is going to you know, get their patient the big payout. You know? So uh, just an FYI for people that do TBIs, you know, maybe CIHR, who needs you, right? We can, you know, I'm just saying, this is, this is just very interesting that I'm seeing the, this real interesting trend in terms of lawyers. Uh, looking right on the website, they've got DTI images right on their website with track-based spatial statistics. So just a little FYI. But we can do all kinds of tractography with this technique, which is kind of like the eye candy of DTI, but that's not really very, uh, very quantitative. So we do diffusion tensor imaging to measure the tracks, but we're looking at numbers instead, and fractional anisotropy is certainly a number we actually look at. Fractional anisotropy is a, a metric, as I said, of the diffusion ellipsoid. So it's a measurement, it's, it's like a, almost like an average of the eigenvalues of the, of the ellipsoid. So um, if the eigenvalues are all equal to each other, you get a sphere, where if you get one of them being really large, you get more of a cylindrical safe shape thing. So one large eigenvalue compared to the other two means you're in myelin, it's both pipes. So we're looking for changes in FA, or we look at changes in the actual eigenvalues themselves, which indicate something different in terms of the diffusivity. Measuring um, along uh, with DTI, along the corpus callosum, and now this is a pilot study, we really didn't find anything happening in the genio or the spleenium of the corpus callosum based on DTI in these TBI patients. So we looked at fractional anisotropy as well as mean diffusivity as another metric. So these were like, well, if we have more, more, more patients, Maybe if we look at the GNU, um, maybe we're going to get significance if we have another dozen patients or something based on power. Now, one thing I'm going to say here, and I'm going to say it more than once, this is a group analysis of a bunch of kids that had, like, this kid got wiped out in hockey, this kid got hit playing soccer, this kid wiped on the ice, whatever. Everyone's got a different injury. 
So one of the biggest problems with the TBI studies that are out there are they're all based on group analysis. Now, I was talking to Lawrence Ryan earlier, and I said, I was, I'm, I'm guilty of that too. We've done these things, group analysis, until we really stop and say, hey, what are, we, what are we doing this for? It's silly, because everybody has a different type of injury. So we have to be able to deal with the fact that everybody has a different injury, right? Group analysis doesn't make sense because they're not rats, right? Okay, so this is probably why we don't see anything of interest with this particular scan. But because we just feel like we have to, we did group analysis. And whatever it means, this group of kids shows some sort of differences in the white matter. This is based on uh, fractional anisotropy differences, group analysis of healthy kids versus the healthy controls. I mean, the TBI kids versus healthy age match controls. So we see some differences, but what does it mean if everyone had a different injury? Right? So that's a bit of an issue to think about. Besides, I always say this fact, if I'm a patient that has an injury, and I walk into the doctor's office and they say, oh, we're going to do this thing, and you're in group A or B, and look, you're just like group A is. Well, what about me? I don't want to be in a group. I want to vote me. Right? I want to personalize my treatment or my therapy or my diagnostics or whatever. And with TBI, we have to certainly personalize how we're analyzing and assessing the injury. Now, other people have seen uh, differences in DTI as well, based on group and group-based statistics. So, my good friend Michelle Keeley at the University of Toronto has reported differences in, in, uh, in these kind of metrics as well. Uh, these are kids that played rep level hockey. I think it was AAA level boys hockey, at age 14 or something like that. And there's certainly differences within some of these areas in the white matter. That she said uh, differences in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex were very important in terms of her study. And uh, you know. That's great, there's been lots of those group analysis, but really what we need to do is personalize things. So if we then look at this paper here, this was a nice group in a plus one paper a couple years ago, and what they did was personalize the analysis, and this is the way we're going in terms of all this DTI stuff, or even just FMRI or whatever. So in this particular paper, they found that uh, in post-concussive patients, they were doing single subject analysis based on Z-scoring. And that's what we have to do. We have a Z-score, which means we have a population of scans. We have a mean and standard deviation per voxel over the entire brain. And then we can compare with Z-scoring that one brain to our normative population. So this was started in this plus one paper, doing Z-scoring of any of our parameters. Could be FA, could be mean diffusivity, or whatever it is. Making the assumption that each voxel is a normal distribution of these particular values. And then our, F, our Z distribution is looking for something on either tail. Is it a, and we're going to hypothesis a single tail test, so it's going to be a lower FA is indicative of an abnormal part of the brain. Making the assumption there's normality, okay, that's one thing. And I've had my students actually do normality analysis, so looking at skewness and kurtosis on a voxel-wide basis. This is some other work published uh, just before that, uh, um, in this brain imaging behavior paper, uh, looking at Z-score maps where a, set, a single patient scoring where red and yellow were abnormal at different levels of abnormality in this particular patient. So now we've got an idea or a way to look at single subject analysis based on a group. Then this is again from that same paper, Z-score maps for two different patients with chronic MTBRI, where blue indicates significantly different areas compared to a normative atlas. Now one of the things I'm going to say right here is the normative atlas part. Because we've got lots of data, right? We've got lots of data in data land. So one of the things that's out there is, uh, and I, I review grants and things all the time, and it says in the grant, we're going to calculate, we're going to have like 50 normal controls and we're going to have 50 disease can, people, whatever. Right? I don't know, you guys all realize you can download thousands and thousands of brains in in the internet. There's all kinds of databases that are available, all different things, like different kinds of magnets, different kinds of <coughs> fMRI protocols, different kinds of DTI protocols. The data is all there to download for free. You just have to get an account. I can help anyone who wants to do this. That's what we did. Instead of actually spending money and spending time and wasting people's time gathering data, just get data off one of these databases. And we've downloaded 50 healthy kids for our pediatric study to make our Z-score maps for whatever we're doing. So there's lots of ways to get tons of data that's already present. So instead, again, instead of wasting our time, you know, I, I, I was thinking, man, I gotta, I gotta get all this data to do Z-scoring. I need at least 42. Wow, no, forget it. I can just get the data for free off the database, okay? And I can contribute to the database, right? Okay. 
So that's what we're actually doing with our particular DTI stuff right now. And I'm going to show a bit more on that soon. The other technique is functional MRI, which you guys have heard about, I'm sure, right? You heard about that? So it's just changing in this blood oxygen level dependency. We get an increase in oxyhemoglobin locally to the brain when we get activation. Increase in oxygenation leads to an increase in this T2 star weighted signal. That's a pretty classic thing. And it's pretty easy to do fMRI. I've been doing it since the late 90s. Okay? It was first published in 1991, 1990, and around there. Uh, it's whatever you want to do. fMRI is like you want to just make the brain do something. Anything we can figure out where it's being activated and some details about it. So this is an fMRI. This is like a standard slide. It's all over the internet. And uh, you just have a person in there. You can present whatever kind of stimuli you want to them. Uh, and I've done, you name it, stimuli. I've done all, all of them out with different ways to do this. And then fMRI is just get a 3D data set. Whatever your favorite one is. It has to be high resolution. Like a T1 weighted 3D like this one. And then follow it with these bold images. Just get tons of them. Um, every two seconds or whatever you want it to be. Uh, just lots and lots of data for however length of time you want it to go for. And uh, then you do some statistics on that. So this is, uh, let's say, an activation of some, uh, we had a toothbrush going on someone's hand. We do it on and off, like a sensory on and off paradigm. And then we see the bold signal going up when we're scratching the toothbrush, and when we're not, the bold signal comes down. And then we can uh, do something like where we have a baseline and a stimulation, and then we have some sort of a hemodynamic response function we model against. And then we have some data. So we can then pick our favorite test, whatever it is. It could be a correlation. It could be, a, we could be doing against the frequency domain too, and do coherence studies. We can do T tests, we can do F tests, we can do, we don't even have to do any of those tests. We want to do multivariate stuff with PCA or ICA or whatever. I mean, the, the, the sky's the limit in terms of analysis. But the simplest way is doing a correlation or a T test. And uh, I always like these slides from Jody Cullen from the University of Western Ontario. They're, they're really brilliant in terms of how they put together. But this is just condition one and two. Do a statistic against them. And then you can then put a threshold and statistical map on top of your high resolution T1 way of image. And that's exactly what it is. And there's tons of free software nowadays that you can do this. You don't have to write it yourself in MATLAB like I used to do. Right? So it's nice to have free stuff. So this is just an example of the contralateral motor task. It's tapping these fingers and then tapping these fingers and you get op opposite side activation. It's called contralateral and you get ipsilateral activation in the cerebellum. It's classic, classic stuff. So, and it's really, really straightforward to do. So we can do task-based fMRI on our concussion kids, our concussed patients or whatever. Now this is back to the group analysis stuff though, right? This is all based on group designs. We have 10 people with concussion, 10 match controls, and then try to compare them. Everyone's got a different injury, but Michelle's published some awesome work looking at, let's say, verbal working memory. Memory's a favorite in terms of concussion because you don't remember stuff. You forget little things. Like I, like I was saying at, uh, just with one of the people I met today, I forgot who, which person, but I met so many people. Just, uh, I was, uh, when I had a concussion, my last one, two years ago, I was teaching a couple days later, and I remember the equation, it was written in my master's thesis, I should know this cold. I was like, delta E equals, uh, it's something, I don't remember. And I said, it's in the book. And I remember one of the kids in class said, Professor, there's no book for this course. Uh, it's in some book somewhere. It's, it, there's a book in the library that must have that equation. I have no idea what it is. So, you know, you forget these little tidbits uh, that, that you should know, right? It's, it's really, really disconcerting. Luckily, it, hopefully it comes back. Mine came back after nine months. Nine months of little forgetful things, right? It was great at home. I tell my wife, oh, it's a concussion. That's why I forgot to uh, do the dishes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. Other things like nonverbal working memory. So Michelle has done tons of stuff based on group analysis for function that we're on. Now, one of the problems, though, is these are really subject dependent. Not only just are they dependent on the injury, everyone's got a different injury, but they're also subject dependent. I am terrible for fMRI task based studies. Because I'm looking at them and I'm going, what is this? Like, it'll say something like, the cowboy saw a rabbit, okay? And then, the and then it'll say, that's one slide. Then the next slide says, the cowboy read a book, all right? And you're supposed to say yes or no, okay? The most normal people would say, no, the cowboy you know, saw a rabbit, not a book. And I'm thinking, maybe there was like a rabbit in the book. Maybe it was one of those kids' books, you know, those rabbits in there, you know? And then all of a sudden, I'm screwing the whole experiment up. 
And so there's people like me, and there's other people that are bad, just generally bad. So why not do something that doesn't rely on a task, which is called resting state f and run. Now in this, we tell our subjects to lay in the magnet and don't think of anything in particular. What does that mean? Okay, really, what does that mean? Like who can not who can who can not think of anything? Well, it's it's a funny. We can debate this all day long, but it's basically your brain just doing what it does when it's not doing anything, which means you're thinking about all kinds of stuff. You're laying there going, "Gosh, when is this going to be over?" You know, and you're thinking, "Well, I got to get out of here. I think I got to meet my friends tonight. I got to make dinner. Oh, I got homework to do. You know, I got all this stuff on your mind. It's just going. It's processing. That's what the resting state is. Whatever. That's not rest though. That's just the thing state. Whatever. I don't know. But it's interesting, and I said philosophically, this, you know, what is a resting state? There's really no such thing as the brain at rest. But that's what we call it. You're not doing a task. So that's what we typically do. Now, this is just what a bold image looks like, and it should be a movie, but uh, this projector doesn't like my movies. Anyway, so we can certainly do fast scans, and we can go up to 100 millisecond resolution. So that's pretty quick in terms of functional MRI. But uh, we can do these studies, and we can understand things in the resting state uh, where you can do things like functional connectivity, which are what parts of the brain are actually temporally correlated with one another, which is sort of what functional MRI, uh, well, the, the resting state analysis is all about. Or we can do uh, things like networks. So we can do things like coherence, what's happening in the frequency domain, we can happen, what's happening in the temporal domain as well, so the time domain. We can do connection studies, we can do functional segregation, we can do all kinds of very interesting things at a very, very good spatial resolution. And I say good because I'm comparing it to EEG, which has horrible spatial resolution. But I gotta tell you, I love EEG for its temporal resolution, right? Absolutely. That's why I like putting the two techniques together. You get the best of both worlds. But we can certainly look at a lot of interesting things in terms of these networks in the time domain or in the frequency domain. So that kid I showed you with all those little micro bleeds, right? Okay, you had, you had a, a GCS of three. So we said, I wonder what, that was 16 months after his injury, 14 year old. So I was lucky, I had a, I have a whole ton of data. I had a healthy 14 year old, we did resting state on him. And I thought, let's compare what this kid's resting state default mode networks like, the kid that was really low on the GCS. Okay, so we did that. So this is a healthy 14 year old Default mode network. So this is probably the most dominant network in your whole brain. It gives you this self-awareness and uh, retrospection and just where you are, what you are, sort of thing like that. So we can see things like the posterior singlet being very, very strong. This is the main seat placement is in there. You see frontal life fields, hippocampi, classic default mode network, a strong network in the temporal domain. This kid, this 14-year-old that's been hit pretty badly, when you actually look at his default mode network, it's virtually gone. Which, when you look at the kid, and a nice kid, I like to talk to all the patients, this kid, when you talk to him, it's honestly talking through a glass, playing a pane of glass. He's not all there. He's, he seems to be looking past you. It's just a really weird feeling when you're and talking to him. They said he's just not the same kid he used to be. So, you know, it's really interesting that you see this big change in the default mode network. It seemed to match. The psychologist I worked with said, yeah, this is like default mode network. It should be completely, totally trashed. But when you look at the literature about default mode network, by the way, when you look at the literature, you'll get confused. Because the default mode network, you'll see this dozen papers say the default mode network seems to have increased functional connectivity with traumatic brain injury. Then you'll see this dozen papers over here has a decreased functional connectivity in the default mode network. So what's going on? So bottom line, once again, is we got everybody's got a different kind of injury. And trying to do group analysis on this stuff is not the way to go. What needs to be done, even with the resting state, like I said, with the TBI, with the, sorry, with the DTI, is we need to do a Z-score-based analysis on functional networks. Because then we get an understanding of each patient and how their injury is actually affecting the temporal characteristics of their functional process. So there's dozens of these networks in the brain, dozens and dozens. This is just the 13 of the dominant ones from one of my former students that published a paper. It was for another reason, but we can see lots of these functional networks that we can actually probe. But if you want to do a, this particular way, this is actually very, very difficult. You need group analysis to do this. It's called a probabilistic independent component analysis. But there are dozens of ones that we can potentially look at with this approach. 
Now, in our pilot study we did on, on our uh, uh, immediate, like within a month after entry, again based on group analysis, and I'm kicking myself that we've done this, but you all know that I'm honest about that. Group analysis says the auditory network has less functional connectivity in this pilot study we did versus healthy control. And there's just a little bit of that. That's a statistically di different area with those two networks. We also look at the default mode network in our particular study with those six kids. The default mode network was greater in those six kids. That, did, that didn't include that catastrophic one where the default mode network's all trash. This is our other population. So we found that's increased, which, which is really confusing. Well, it's not confusing. It's just that group analysis isn't a good thing to do. Sensory motor network was also uh, increased in MTGI versus control. So again, group analysis, what does it mean? We, we really shouldn't be going this way. But I just showed the results anyway. The last kind of thing that I wanted to show, and uh, I'll go with that. How long did I talk, Chase? A couple more minutes, anyway. A couple more minutes? Yeah. i got a couple more hours I can talk now. I'm getting into it. <laughs> Four. <laughs> I'll Four minutes. There. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm not going to talk about our spectroscopy. Let me just talk about this one uh, last thing we're doing that's really more exciting. Spectroscopy is um, um, kind of a more difficult approach to do because you don't know where the injury is. But you can measure things that are uh, metabolites that are representative of neuronal health. But it's, uh, I want to show you what's next coming down the pipe. Okay? Our current working hypothesis that we're playing with these days is that we have a complex system in the brain. All right, so it's not a, some sort of linear time invariant system, right? In engineering, we love to talk about LTI. Linear time invariance, beautiful. Brain doesn't work like that, okay, at all. We've got to throw our LTI stuff to the side. We have to do very, very complex analysis on brain if we really, really want to understand the true things that are going on. We also know, so we're looking at complexity measurements. So we're using chaos theory and fractal models to understand the brain's complexity. We also know exercise potentiates symptoms, uh, and uh, they come along when we're recovering in our patients. We exercise, and they re and return their symptoms. And we know that brain sodium and potassium regulation gets impaired with injury. So you see these people are really, really sluggish. So that, that says, it should say, if you've taken your biomedical engineering, it should say to you, there's something going on with our sodium potassium flux with all of our action potentials. Now, this is, this is one of the things we don't have any data on yet because I've got to build a coil at Christmas. But uh, we do a lot of sodium imaging in my lab. Now, we can do intra and extracellular sodium with something called quantum filters with MRI. So our theory right now is we're going to image intra and extracellular sodium in these patients because think about this. Sodium and potassium are kept at these big differences in concentration. Sodium is very high extracellularly and low intracellularly, and potassium is opposite. And we get these action potentials happening and sodium floods in and blah, blah, blah on the action potential, right? Now, if you've got all these micro tears in your membranes, doesn't it make sense that the sodium is going to start to equilibrate a bit more? And you're not going to be able to have that transmembrane gradient as, as nicely as it is. So we're working on, we've got the sequences developed for sodium intra and extracellular measurements. So I'm pretty damn sure that those are going to be really, really telltale for concussion. So that's what we're working on with that. And just to show you a bit of the complexity analysis, um, in my lab we do a lot of work with chaos and fractals and stuff like that. You can analyze these signals, not, you know, Fourier is great. I love Fourier. Woo you know, good times. But you've got to get beyond Fourier now and again. You know, you can go short time Fourier transform. Woo you know, good times, right? But no. What about wavelet? I love wavelets. Okay? Let's take it a little step further by looking at scaling in signals. We can actually look at this in terms of the fractal nature of the signal. And we published some work on this where we can actually look at whether signals are chaotic or not so chaotic. Now, if you look at some of the work we've done in the past, and actually I won't get into the analysis, it's easy actually. It sounds like it should be hard, but it's actually pretty easy. We measured some stuff in the past that we wanted to get rid of the complexity in the brain. We know the brain is a complex system. There's no doubt about that. And if you want to try to understand complexity, you can, you can make chaos with logistic equations and things like that. It's easy. But what if you have data and you want to know if it's chaotic or not? So you or, or complex. So we measured something called the Hurst exponent, and the Hurst exponent uh, increases when you're into levels of uh, non-chaotic systems or non-complex uh, non systems. So in this particular experiment we published, we had uh, before and then after drinking six ounces of Bushmills Irish whiskey. So 
what we wanted to do is get rid of the way the brain can behave like complex, right? So when someone's really drunk, their brain isn't adapting, it isn't very functional. So we had an empty stomach, I had no shortage volunteers. No shortage. <laughs> empty stomach, first thing in the morning, no coffee, six ounces of Bushmills, down the hatch, and do some measurements, right? So this is based on the bold signal. So the brain went from a complex system into more closer to a linear system. And then as the person sobered up, it returned to be a complex system once again. So we can measure this quite easily. This is a movie, and I know it doesn't work from this projector, but again, we did this on Alzheimer's patients. We had a very large cohort of early onset Alzheimer's suspected. And we found that the brain was, the complexity of the temporal domain was reducing in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so that's a really important point. Because that's why, that's what's happening. Remember, complexity is health. If you get something like anything, heart rate variability is really, really high if you've got a healthy heart. But as soon as if you had a, if you had a heart rate, and you did a Fourier transform of that and get a delta function, that person's about to die. You get a non-adaptive heart. So we know complexity is healthy, and it's very, very healthy in the brain. So we measure this in Alzheimer's. Uh, this is pretty fresh off of uh, off the old, uh, it's kind of blurry, but uh, this is one of our, our, our subjects done with Z-score analysis, but Z-score of the fractal nature of the bold signal. So we've done a whole bunch of normal controls, and this is someone that was just concussed at the top within one month. And you see some differences. It's sort of hard to see in this blurry looking image, but it's a bit different in this part of the brain than back. And then within uh, four months and seven months, the brain was back to being a complex system. So that just shows you the concussive action, actually, whatever it was, it caused the complexity of that part of the brain to decrease. Okay? So. The last thing we're doing, and then I'm going to wrap it up, I'm just going to show you a picture, is we're, uh, we're actually doing measurements of exercise uh, in our magnets. So, and then I see Chase standing up there. So we've developed ergometers for exercise because exercise brings on the symptoms of concussion. And I wanted to show you that you can make an ergometer from bits you find in a dumpster, which we did. You can uh, standardize it with these therabands. You go to the, you know, for rehab and you can color the, the amount of force you can put in. So, there's our first ergometer. Our second ergometer, we made it of oak, and we made the coils as well, so they're all, you know, really Health Canada approved looking coils. It was research. It wasn't a patient, it was a student, so no problem. And then we bought a nice low day ergometer that we do exercise studies in the magnet now. So this is actually what we're doing now. We're getting people to exercise, you know, we're getting uh, rest and stay bold. Uh, we're then getting the exercise and we're analyzing after the fact when they're getting these symptoms coming back. Uh, we've got already our studies done where we know what happens, uh, exercise effects on the healthy brain. We absolutely know what that is. It changes some of the rest of the networks, which actually do make sense. That paper is submitted for publication and I'm running out of time. Chase is standing. I can definitely tell you which networks they are if anybody's interested, but uh, we certainly um, we certainly have gone far in terms of looking at exercise. So the last thing I wanted to end with is, uh, is just a movie. I like movies. Uh, and it won't work really on this uh, projector, but I just wanted to show you uh, something to think about right here. So look at this. So this is a woodpecker, right? We can learn from animals. One thing, you ever wonder why woodpeckers don't get concussions? You know? well, they've got some very, very special adaptations in terms of, uh, they don't get concussions. Right? But uh, you know, can you imagine if you did that, right? That would be a, probably a painful thing to do all the time. Then there's this one right here, these big horned sheeps, right? These things are like always smashing their heads together, right? So these animals, they're doing this all the time for good times, good fun. Um, you know, wow, you know, they, they, uh, they do that all the time. So, and actually just uh, looking at the slow motion woodpecker, look, look, watch his head, watch this. So I got these off of YouTube, so well, just watch the guy's head. Okay? So you'd think that this animal would be getting concussions all the time. But there's a whole bunch of interesting anatomical adaptations in woodpeckers that, that, that prevent the brain actually from getting shocked. All right? So that's, uh, I, I actually, uh, when I went through this one video, I said, oh, that's why concussions don't happen in woodpeckers. But uh, I think what we need to do is we've got to do this now. This is our next study. <laughs> this is our grad students, right? So, uh, so come on, guy. Get over there. So, uh, so this is what we need. So, uh, oh, come on. Get the football helmet on, the Riddell. So, oh. So, uh, now, why would anybody do that? Like, I, I don't know.
But uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm running away. So uh, you know, with uh, with that, um, 